I won't be there in Acts chapter 10. So, <laughs> welcome back. I don't know if the recording started uh, ahead of this, but yeah, uh, I was saying that we were in Acts chapter 10 and we saw how Peter went and ministered to Cornelius's household for the first time. There was a change of heart for him, uh, and uh, people were quite eagerly expecting. Uh, you know, a word from Peter, but even when he was speaking about Jesus, it already fell upon them. Uh, and what happens next? Okay, let's let's look at that. So we see later on that uh, uh, once the Holy Spirit fell on them, verse forty-five, those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Let me finish that. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. So in the early church, we've already seen, uh, particularly Acts chapter 8, when um, Philip goes to Samaria and he preaches the gospel. What happens next? Peter and John, they come there, the leaders of the church, they come because they want to teach the people uh, uh, or rather they want to minister the baptism with the Holy Spirit. The way in which God works among the Gentiles is, is, Gentiles is somewhat different. Peter is preaching the message and usually what do we expect earlier when the first time Peter preached? He preached, people were water baptized. But now Peter is preaching and they are Holy Spirit. Okay? Then they are water baptized. So, something for us to note here. Because nowadays people ask questions, right? Okay, I'm a believer. Should I first be water baptized? Or uh, uh, how do I need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Should I become a little more mature in Christ and then, you know, we can pray for uh, baptism in the Holy Spirit. These are all questions that we, we receive. But when you look at Acts chapter 10, the way God worked, people were just listening. And they, while listening to the sermon, they are starting to believe in Jesus. They are baptized in the Holy Spirit. They started speaking in tongues. And Peter says, look, God only did not withhold baptism with the Holy Spirit. How can we withhold baptism with water? Let's go ahead. We will baptize them with water. So people are water baptized after Holy Spirit baptism. So just something for us to note because, you know, somewhere we may have questions regarding this matter. So uh, I'll just open up before we jump to Acts chapter 11. If there are any uh, points of discussion from 10, we can discuss that. Please feel free to ask if uh, you have any questions. Yeah. Um, so I just have uh, one question about this passage. So uh, we see Cornelius uh, is not a Jewish, actually. So but when it says he's, he prayed to God or he fasted, <laughs> which God he was praying to actually that's one of the doubts I have and the other thing is uh, I just want a little more definition on uh, Italian regiment what it actually means uh, yeah okay so you see earlier we have uh, noticed uh, I think it's Acts chapter 4 and Yeah, so Acts 4.12, it says uh, uh, salvation is in salvation. There's no salvation in any other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Okay, sorry, I messed up the line a little bit there. But the point is salvation is only in the name of Jesus. So even though Cornelius was a devout uh, uh, believer in God, 
which God was he following? He was following the Jewish God. That, that's what my understanding is, because um, he was faithful to God to follow. Even though he was not a Jew, he was keeping the traditions to serve this God of the Jews. However, that was not good enough. Where is salvation found? It's found in the name of Jesus. So he needed to be saved or he needed to be born again, which is why God orchestrated this meeting uh, and asked Peter to come and preach about Jesus. OK, is that clear? Yeah, so that is one thing. Now coming to the Italian regiment. OK, Italian regiment, uh, well, there is a little bit that I know. Uh, fine. Okay. Yeah, so there's a little bit of write up over here which I can read. Uh, it says, see, Italian regiment is, we need to understand that he is uh, um, in that Roman city. So when you say Italian, right? They are Italian, isn't it? Yeah. Simple as that. It's just the regiment of that particular place uh, in that Roman Empire. But you know, having said that, uh, it says that there were Italian volunteers and were considered the most loyal Roman troops. Okay. And uh, what else about them? 32 such Italian cohorts were stationed in the different provinces of the empire. So basically, it's all these groups of soldiers, um, and uh, they were they were uh, overseen by this particular centurion known as Cornelius. I I think it's quite. Uh, anything more in that you want to know? Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. It's one more thing to be clear on. Uh, in verse 30, it says, four days ago, I was fasting until this hour and mm -hmm. that the ninth hour. So, I mean, in I think in so many places in Bible, we see this, this hour, that hour, third hour, fourth hour, and so mm -hmm. many things. So is it like the time that we follow today, nine o'clock? <laughs> or uh, the Bible has any other uh, thing about it? Or is it? It just says the time, like if it's third hour, it's three o'clock or... How do we actually interpret it? Yeah, sure, uh, Jafida. So whenever you find these hours, right, um, at least in the Book of Acts, it is as per the Jewish traditions. So they had particular times of prayer. OK, uh, something like thrice a day, they needed to pray to God, and then they would go to the temple also. That is why even when it comes to uh, uh, Acts chapter 2, it says, uh, I, I don't know which hour it says, but uh, at, at that particular hour, Peter gives a defense, right? He says that it's still just the, what, ninth hour or something. Now, how can you say that we are drunk? Because it was early in the morning. Okay. So they take consideration of those uh, hours because those hours are very important like the correct prayer times for all the jewish people so that's why it's part of their conversation everywhere nothing else about it and your question was today do we have to follow not really oh like that okay so what is the third hour you're asking Okay, let me see if I can find you that answer. Like, uh, when we read the hour, we think like three o'clock in the afternoon. Like yeah, I don't morning. think it's it, it's not. Uh, if it says the third hour, it does not necessarily mean uh, that it is three o'clock. Okay, let me just check here. Anyone else? Do you think you can help us? Maybe you can. Search faster. Okay. 
So what hour does it say here? Nine hour. Nine hour. OK, so here uh, I just Google that, and it says roughly 3, 3 PM, 3 to 5 PM is the night that yeah so that's what it's not you don't go by just because it says night that don't go by that uh i don't know why so, they have so basically i said that you have their own words to the correct correct yeah so they have apparently it says here they have something like a typical divine hours a three hour pattern um where 6 a.m., 9 a.m., noon, 3 p.m., and 6 p.m. are uh, their prayer times. So they were very particular about that. And even the day, they describe it like that. Yeah, sure. OK. All right. So any other thoughts regarding Acts 10? Okay, so Acts 10, whenever we recall Acts 10, something uh, very important that we see here is that the gospel went from the Jews to the Gentiles. And God used a most unlikely person, such as Peter, who was a very, you know, a committed Jew to minister to the Gentiles. So, uh, I mean, th there's so much you can talk about it in relevance to our lives and the way we are. And our mindsets are, um, but I'll just stop with that. I think it's for us to study and uh, really take lessons from uh, what actually happened. And also, you know, the way God spoke in, in that particular passage, that's also something to study. Now, moving on to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 is a, a, a very, very encouraging passage because we see the birth of uh, or rather the existence of another church, okay, a strong church. And how did this church come about? We are going to look at that. Who are the people who actually uh, 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 sort of established this church? We are going to look at that. We're also going to look at how this church functioned. We're also going to look at the uh, impact of this church, okay, a special church. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and delve right into Acts chapter 11. So now coming to the first portion, we will still be talking a little bit about, you know, uh, uh, the what just happened in Acts chapter 10. So let's read through that initial portion, Acts 11 verses 1 through 18, where Peter narrates his uh, experience of the trance, what he saw. So maybe we won't read it because, as I told you, he, there'll be a lot of repetition of the same vision. So he just repeats the whole thing. And then he explains right, uh, how uh, God actually brought him to Cornelius's house. And then when he started to speak the message, he describes that the Holy Spirit actually fell on the people. And uh, yeah. Withstand God. Okay, verse 17. I'll just read uh, verse 17. Uh, if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? You see? So finally, Peter is giving in to the plans of God and uh, he's accepting what God is accepting. Okay. So this is an explanation actually that uh, Peter is giving uh, in Jerusalem. So all this explanation was mentioned to the uh, believers in Jerusalem. Reason is they know Peter as a man who always stands up for the Jews. Or here they are using the term circumcision. Who are, who are circumcised? Obviously, the Jews were circumcised. So he was a man. Uh, who was always for the people of circumcision. But now they'll question him, isn't it? They'll ask him, how could you go to Cornelius's house? How could you go to a, a Gentile's house? So then he gives this whole 
explanation of how he saw the vision and what he understood. And when he was talking, the Holy Spirit was poured out. Now, God did not withhold the same gift that he gave us. Who am I to stop? So I went ahead and I spoke to the Gentiles. Uh, and what is the outcome of that? We find in verse 18 that the believers who heard this news, they were also happy. So thank God they were happy that the gospel was being taken out to uh, the Gentiles now. Now moving on from verse 19. I told us that we are going to see about a special church. So here we'll start to study about a church called as the Church of Antioch. Okay, so there are many Antiochs, so don't get confused. You'll also find Antioch again. Uh, but this is the Antioch of Syria. Okay, Antioch of Syria. That's how you must remember that chapter 11, Antioch is of Syria. So uh, how did this church come about? So we see in uh, verse 19 uh, of uh, Acts 11 that there was a great time of persecution. And uh, at the time when Stephen, right, Stephen uh, was martyred, and at that time, people fled. And they fled into these regions, you know, uh, Phoenicia, uh, Cyprus, Antioch. And over there, through one of, through those people who actually, uh, you know, left Jerusalem, and then they went off to another city, the church was established. So whenever we try to look for the names of the people who planted this strong church, you cannot find the names. OK, so what is the significance of uh, this thought? The significance is that actually God can use anyone to plant the church. We need not necessarily be people with the fivefold ministry calling on our lives. Uh, it can be any believers, because the church of Antioch came about like that. Some believers who went there, they planted the church. Uh, and then, of course, once the church was planted, we see the emergence of very strong leaders. You will see names like you know Barnabas and Saul, Paul uh, at, at this point. So they will start to lead the church. Uh, uh, but it was not initiated by any fivefold ministry uh, of his people. All right. Uh, let's probably just read through the passage that will make things clearer for you. Verse 19 to verse 26. Okay, this is about the church of Antioch. Can somebody read it? Now, those who were scattered after the persecution that rose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Christ, the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then news of these th of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. When he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them that all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great and a great many people were added to the Lord. Then Barnabas departed to Tarsus to seek Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for the whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Amen. OK, so there you go. Uh, this is the second decade. Remember, we, we were talking about the first decade, Acts 1 to uh, like uh, Acts, 
7 somewhere there now acts 8 to acts 13 is the next decade and what exactly are we seeing happening from acts 8 we, we talked about samaria and uh, you know from there we saw how uh, philip went to caesarea and then uh, we saw the gospel going out to ethiopia through the eunuch and then uh, you know acts 9 we saw damascus you know uh, even earlier, we, we saw Philip was led to that uh, Gaza place, right? And uh, Damascus, that was another name that we saw. And in that passage, Acts 9, again later, uh, through the ministry of Peter, we saw uh, Joppa, Sharon, Lita, uh, we move on, Acts 10, and then Cornelius' house, Caesarea. Okay, so what's happening? Till like Acts 7, the spotlights were on Jerusalem. But now the revival fires are spreading, right? So, excuse me, quite clearly. And how is it spreading? That's another thing for us to look at. Through volunteers, we had Philip. Through leaders, Peter. Uh, and then we uh, now are beginning to see the work through Paul also. Paul tried to preach the gospel. So there's another leader, Paul. And now again, uh, we see the Antioch church. Okay. And uh, the leaders of Jerusalem take notice of another region now. Okay. Antioch. Now, when we are discussing about the revival fire spreading, Acts 8 to about Acts 13, that again is a decade actually, a decade of time where. The gospel went uh, across the region. Uh, we notice that the church of Jerusalem, when they saw that you know the gospel was spreading, they also took the initiative to build up the people. So Samaria, they sent their leaders. Now that <laughs> they are hearing about the church in Antioch, they need to send some leaders, isn't it? So whom are they sending this time? Barnabas. Okay, he was a good man. They said Barnabas. And they wanted Barnabas to actually start to um, uh, equip the church in Antioch. So that is very important. Remember, we can't just uh, um, have churches planted and then think that automatically people will grow. The leaders of the church were very responsible, the leaders of Jerusalem. So they were governing okay and also this is what is known as apostolic ministry in your second year we've talked about it right where apostolic is <laughs> to be sent out to new regions but that also means that we must have a good governance over the churches that are planted so all this is observed you know as as uh, we read through acts 8 through 13 Okay, so in the church in Antioch, uh, we have now seen the name of a person called Barnabas who was sent here to equip them. So let's read on and see what else is going to happen in this Antioch church. Okay, so Barnabas has come. Uh, uh, did Brother read verse 25? Okay, a uh, fine. So, uh, okay, till 26. So we've also seen the name of Saul. Even earlier, who was the one who um, spoke for Saul in Jerusalem? It was Barnabas. Okay, And I told us that the personality of Barnabas was such that he wanted to accommodate. Even if it was a young leader, he was like a mentor figure. So this time also, when it comes to Antioch, he feels that Saul will be a good person to actually build up the people here. So he goes and seeks uh, <clears throat> Saul. Okay, And when he found him, scripture says he brought him to Antioch. So how long do they do ministry, Paul and Barnabas? For one year. For one year, they do ministry. And uh, a lot of people are taught. And it says something special. For the first time, the believers were called as Christians in Antioch. 
before this what what were the believers known as or what was their faith known as we've discussed that also do you recall those who believed in jesus what were they called Saul was persecuting the people of the of the way. That's right. Yeah. So they were known as the people of the way. And now, for the first time, they are called as Christians. Okay, in Acts chapter 11. So I can see a question from Jeffina. She says, What's the meaning of Hellenist? Hellenists are Greek-speaking Jews. So there were Hebrew-speaking Jews and there were Greek-speaking Jews. And a little more about Hellenists could be that the Hebrew-speaking Jews were proud of, uh, you know, they are uh, sort of, they felt that they were more, they were pure Jews. Whereas the Greek speaking Jews were a little bit touched by the Greek culture. So they were looked down upon. That is why, if you remember Acts chapter 6, there also there was a dispute, right? Between the Hebrew speaking Jews and the Hellenists, that their widows were neglected. So that's how it was. Okay. Coming back to Acts 11. So there's a church of Antioch. You have Barnabas, you have uh, um, Saul, one year they teach, and the church is actually uh, like, like a, it's a, it's a huge assembly as of now. So let's see what else is happening. At this point, there will be a relief which will be planned for Judea. So uh, could somebody read from verse 27 to 30? Acts, yeah. Acts, Acts chapter 11, verse 27 to 30. And in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the day of Gladius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and so on. Barnabas and so on. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So uh, here we can see the picture of apostolic ministry coming through even more powerfully because there's the Church of Antioch. Initially, who was sent to the Church of Antioch? A bunch of teachers. Barnabas, Saul, they came for a whole year. What did they do? They taught. What could they have taught? Same thing. Remember, we discussed uh, in the early church, they taught the uh, doctrine of the apostles, which would have been the teachings of Jesus and the, uh, you know, the, the key books of uh, the Jews. And also, you know, they uh, would have proclaimed about the kingdom of God and many such things that uh, Jesus actually taught them. Same things would have been passed on to the new believers in Antioch. So a bunch of teachers have come, they have done their work. Who is the next team that is being sent from Jerusalem? Prophets. Okay. So how was apostolic ministry done those days? So if there is a new church plant, it cannot be neglected. We have to build up the people. So we may need to send teachers to establish them in the key doctrine, then prophets, right? So that the work of the spirit is strengthened in their midst. So at this point, you have a bunch of prophets going, one of whom a notable prophet is Agabus. So Agabus comes there. And Agabus makes a prophecy. 
he talks about a famine that will spread throughout the world okay uh, and so when they hear about this that there is going to be a famine they this church okay decides that they want to send relief to the brethren in judea brethren in judea so what do they do they start to uh, work on it okay so we have to see <clears throat> how reliable or how credible the prophets of those days were so the prophet came and told them there's going to be a famine excuse me just a moment Okay, thank you. So uh, I was saying that, uh, you know, there, there were credible prophets because it was quite a major prophecy that there's going to be a famine. And uh, people actually responded to that word. Obviously, if there's going to be a famine, then there will be needs, right? People will have needs. So they start working towards the relief which they would send to the brethren in Judea. And that's how, um, uh, you know, the, the church was actually strong and strengthening all the, you may want to call it the daughter church or the sister church. This is the kind of terminology uh, that is used for church plants. But the church of Jerusalem, which also you may want to term it as the base church or the mother church, it continued to uh, strengthen the smaller churches so today when we are raising up apostolic ministries how could we impact uh, the region so we must also look at planting churches right so over here also we have church plants but the base church or the mother church should be sensitive enough as led by god to keep sending people who can impart First, we saw teaching, right? So teachers can be sent, prophets can be sent. We can send, um, you know, any other uh, set of people so that the uh, the smaller churches can be strengthened. So mission teams, sending mission teams out, that would be a good way of uh, really doing a strong apostolic work in our times and. Back in those days, you know, they uh, were, were not even able to travel as much as we can travel today. So uh, we have a great opportunity that has been given to us to really strengthen many churches. <clears throat> Nowadays, we also have technology. So uh, it, things are so much more easier. So what are we seeing so far? We're seeing the building up of smaller churches. Um, and uh, the spread of the gospel to uh, different regions. So right at this time, okay, what are some of the other things that are happening around? We've seen what is happening in the church, okay? But what is happening around? 
that is also uh, something for us to take note of. You remember in the early years when Peter, John, uh, and the apostles were ministering, persecution rose up against them. So what is the situation as far as persecution is concerned? Acts chapter 12 will shed some light on it. So let's go ahead and read. It's not like you know a very uh, long passage. So maybe if somebody can, you can read the entire passage. Chapter 12, right? Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Now about the time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church, then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping bound with two chains between two soldiers and the gods before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Grid yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So when he went out and followed him and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision when they were past the first and the second god post they came to an iron gate that leads to the city which opened to them of its own accord and they went out and went down one street and immediately the angel departed from him and when peter had come to himself he said now i know for certain that the lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of herod and from all the expectation of the jewish people so when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together pray. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Now uh, Peter continued knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But motioning them, mo motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Then as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. Now Herod had been very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord and having made Blathus the king's personal aid, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. So on a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne and gave an oration to them. And the people kept shouting the voice of a god and not of a man. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Okay, thank you, uh, Tefina, for reading the entire passage. In this passage, we begin with uh, what the environment looked like at this point when in different regions you had church plants. Persecution was still on, so that had not changed at all. 
and we see the uh, perpetrator of the opposition in this situation is headed. Earlier we saw the council, we saw uh, Saul who was giving consent to the to the murder of Stephen, and then Saul who went to Damascus. So we saw all of that. But right now, Herod, who is this Herod? Because you see that name Herod uh, even earlier when Jesus was born. So Herod uh, would be more specifically Herod Agrippa I. Okay, so he is the uh, grandson of Herod the Great, about whom we had studied earlier, who ruled in the days of uh, Jesus's birth. And uh, this Herod Agrippa I, being the grandson uh, of you know that that particular Herod the Great, uh, had a similar mindset. He was persecuting uh, God's people. Now, this Herod was also related to another Herod, uh, Herod Antipas. Okay, uh, and uh, Herod Antipas was the uncle of Herod Agrippa I. Uh, uh, plus, uh, we see that this Herod Antipas was, uh, he played a role in the trial of Jesus. So, it seems like the whole family, <laughs> they were into uh, opposing the work of God. Uh, I don't know why it was like that, but that's what we see here. So uh, Herod is now angry with the church and he is harassing the church. Now in harassing the church, you tell me, what is the best way to harass a group? Okay, uh, <clears throat> One key thing that uh, people could do is to lay hold on the leaders of the of that particular group. So that's exactly what Herod did. Now we may ask the question, why did he want to target the leaders? Uh, you see, it, it's all political. So <clears throat> maybe he would have got a good uh, response of the people. He would have got their favor uh, by showing his power. And that's why he did these things. So he went ahead and it says, killed James. Who is this James? There are two James, we must not get confused. Uh, and it clarifies here, Luke clarifies, James, the brother of John. So James, the brother of John was killed. But as we go on in the book of Acts, we will also read about another James who emerged as the leader of the church, Okay, sort of the, the main overseer of the church of Jerusalem. But that James is the brother of Jesus. Okay. So that's a different James. Don't get confused. The James who's killed here is the brother of John. All right. So one leader, one apostle is murdered. That's a very painful time for the church. And Herod, uh, because of the kind of response he got by killing James, he also wants to kill Peter. So just to be, get more points with the people. Uh, but strangely, Fortunately or unfortunately, it was a period of time, days of the unlimited bread, uh, when he did not want to disturb the, the uh, things that were going on in the city. So he gave, he caught Peter, he wanted to kill Peter, but because of, uh, you know, the days of the unlimited bread, he postponed it. He did not kill Peter right away. But he kept Peter safe. How did he keep Peter safe? We see the description. He was put in the prison and uh, there were four squads of soldiers to keep him. So that description okay, is to say that there were a good number of strong soldiers in whose custody Peter was uh, uh, detained. So there's no way that Peter can escape. All right, so that is what we understand. <laughs> then what else? Uh, the idea that Herod Agrippa I had was that he is now going to keep him. And finally, during Passover, he'll bring him out before the people. Uh, he will murder Peter also and prove to the people that you know he's so powerful. But something amazing happened. Now, we continue to see supernatural intervention. Uh, we find that in a difficult time, how did the church respond earlier when Peter and John were threatened and Peter and John were put in prison? 
they came, they prayed, isn't it? They came back together and they cried out to God and they started to declare the power of God, declare the glory of God and say, God, uh, you know, you do your works even more powerfully. So the surroundings have not changed. The persecution has not changed. Even the believers have not changed. They continue to pray. It's a crucial time when the leaders of the church have been caught. But the church... The Bible says, verse 5, it says, uh, when Peter was in prison, constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. So that is the way in which they responded. Uh, and, you know, when prayer is happening, we can see God intervening. So a miraculous intervention took place. What happened? Uh, we see that an angel goes and uh, sets Peter free from the prison. So it's almost amazing. It's like a movie, right? So uh, Peter is uh, set free, his chains fell, fell off, and the angel speaks to him and says, arise quickly, um, to, like, you know, gird yourself, tie your sandals, or meaning get ready, okay, put on your garments, follow me. And the angel is taking him out of the prison. And it, uh, Peter thinks he's probably seeing a dream, but in reality, it was an angel, let him out. And he comes to the house of a lady known as uh, Mary, who is the mother of a person called as John Mark. John Mark is a significant person. We are going to read about him later. So remember his name. But this was his house, Mary, uh, John Mark's mother, her, her house. And over there, the prayers were being offered. So now that Peter has been released through the intervention of an angel, uh, people are still praying in that house and a girl, Rhoda, she comes and she opens the door and she finds Peter there. But look at the irony of this thing. She goes back and tells the people. She's excited because they were praying for Peter to be set free. God has set him free. But when she comes back with the news, they are not believing her. They're saying, hey, it can't be, it must be his angel. Because in that Jewish culture, they had a uh, belief that every person had an angel. And so that's why they are saying it must be his angel. But God actually set Peter free. So that also kind of tells us sometimes we pray for things, but when it actually happens, we're like, oh, really? Did it happen? We're not able to accept it. It seems like that you know, for the believers. But Peter was now set free. And uh, you know, God some, did something amazing uh, in his life. And uh, you know, finally, uh, he... Uh, is is now sort of uh, reunited with the church okay yeah and when this happens peter is set free um, obviously there will be repercussions for the soldiers because those days if a prisoner escapes uh, apparently the soldier would be killed so it's a big deal to uh, let a prisoner escape so that's what we see in verse 18 and 19 it says that there was no small stir among the soldiers about what had become of Peter. But when Herod had searched for him and not found him, he examined the guards and commanded that they should be put to death. So they were actually killed because Peter had escaped. Okay. Uh, and after that comes the death of Herod. So something really uh, strange happens. Uh, we find that Herod is in his pride and in his glory. So uh, he had been angry with a section of people of uh, Tyre and Sidon, uh, but they came to him, you know, just to make peace and all that. Uh, and uh, what happens is Herod goes on a like a parade. Okay, just to just to show off his glory that he's so capable, uh, he's able to help people, and he's this mighty king and all of that. But when he does that, um, a picture that is painted by Luke for us is that he was a man of pride. Okay, he was a man of great pride. The kind of apparel he wore and the the way he spoke and even the the praises and the fame that he got from people people even said things like hey this is the voice of a god and not a man but we see that when herod was walking in his pride um, an angel struck him it says okay uh, meaning 
you know how it is, right? Like the Bible says that God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So Herod's pride uh, made God very angry. And we even find that somebody who walked in incredible pride at that time, and maybe not just pride, but we know the kind of things that he was involved in. He was persecuting the church, but there was a judgment that came upon this man. When he was thinking that he's so great and grand and mighty and all that, he just met a very sad end. And the Bible says that he was eaten by worms and died. Okay, So God brought an end to uh, the uh, proud ways of man and the foolish. So let's just stop here. I think our time is up. Uh, there's so much for you to think about and uh, sort of process. We didn't even have discussions. Maybe we'll have to the next class. So we'll just close with a word of prayer. I'll ask Jackie not to. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, everything that you are doing through us, Jesus. We thank you for the authority and the power that you have placed in us. We thank you, God, that you are a God who speaks. You are a God who is our everlasting help. God, I just pray that whatever we have learned today, uh, we praise you for who you are. Help us to get deeper in our relationship with you, Jesus, through the lessons that we learned today. Help us to put it into practice so that we can walk in the authority that you have given us. We can walk in your power. We can walk for your glory down here on this earth. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jafina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, God bless you and bye for